My objective today is to persuade you that we've all been seriously misled about the nature of the economy. We've been led to believe that we live in what's essentially a market economy, an economy where things are produced only to be sold and bought. But the truth is that large parts of our economy are not organized as markets. And our failure to see that has serious political and economic consequences. One of the reasons that we often don't see it is that the political ideologies of both the right and the left are organized around this idea that we live in an essentially market economy. If you speak to someone from the right, then they will tell you that we live in a market economy which is best explained by theories of supply and demand. They'll tell you that it's driven by people pursuing their own interests, but that's a wonderful thing because competition in the market leads to the best possible allocation of goods between people, as long as we can prevent the state from interfering. If, on the other hand, you speak to people on the left, then they will tell you that we live in a capitalist market economy, which is best explained as the systematic exploitation of workers. They'll tell you that it's driven by capitalists pursuing their interests, and that's a terrible thing because it leads to almost all of us being exploited and alienated. And the trick is to use the state to sort it out. Now, perhaps you accept one or the other of those views, or perhaps you have doubts about them both. If you did have doubts about them both, then you might have noticed that there are certain things that they seem to agree on. They seem to agree that we live in a market economy, that it's driven by the selfish pursuit of self-interest, and that the only alternative is the state. And so you might be forgiven for thinking then that if both left and right agree on that, then that much at, at, at least must be true. Well, I want to tell you that the right is wrong, that the left is wrong, and that the things that they both agree on are also wrong. The heart of the problem is this ingrained assumption that we live in a essentially market economy. That assumption leads, for example, uh, economists to measure the economy by just looking at how much stuff is bought and sold. They only count the market economy because they believe that only the market counts as the economy. And this process reinforces our belief that only the market counts as the economy. But to see what's wrong with that, we just need to look back to the economies of the past. In pre-modern societies, people produced things, people grew things, uh, mostly for the use of their own families, and there were systems of transfer that didn't involve buying and selling in the market. In some societies, there were traditional systems of gifting. In others, there were um, hierarchical systems of compulsory transfer. But in all of these societies, the market was a marginal activity. And yet, we still count the production and the transfers that occurred in those societies as economic activity. So why can't we do the same when we look at the contemporary economy. Here I want to invoke the work of two feminist geographers uh, who worked under the, um, the pen name J.K. Gibson Graham. Gibson Graham argued that this idea that we live in an essentially market economy is an ideology, a set of ideas that serves a certain set of interests by concealing something from us. And what these ideas conceal is that large parts of our economy today are not organized as markets. 
The perhaps the most obvious example of that is the one, one that the economists themselves partly realize, and that is the case of the state. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development estimates that between 33% uh, and 58% of the formal economies of the richer countries of the world is accounted for by the state. But the state is by no means the largest non-market sector economies today. That honor falls to the household economy. In the household, we care for children. We cook and clean and make things and grow things and fix things. These are all economic activities which we conduct without any need to buy and sell. When we do make transfers in the household, they take the form of gifts. But how large is this household economy? I've said it's very large. How can I establish that? The problem, of course, is that, as I said, the economists, when they're measuring the size of an economy, only count what is bought and sold. As I've also said, very little is bought and sold within the household. But there are alternative ways of addressing this question, and one is to look at the amount of time that is spent on work. An, an Australian economist called um, Duncan Ironmonger from the University of Melbourne did exactly that. He measured the amount of work done in both the household sector and the market sector in Australia and 11 other major economies in the 1990s. And what Ironmonger found was that as much or more was done in the household sector than in the market sector. So we have the state, which accounts for almost as much of the economy as the market economy. We have the household sector, which accounts for more than the market economy. We have on top of that other areas, charity, volunteering, and a variety of interesting economic forms in the area I want to focus on for the rest of the talk, which is the digital economy. The, the, the internet, the web, is built on the transfer of digital gifts. Whenever you open a page in a web browser on your PC or your smartphone, you're benefiting from the transfer of a free page across the internet. I know there are a few sites that try to charge subscriptions, and perhaps after that page arrives, it might be used to try and sell you something. But the vast majority of the pages that are transferred over the internet are provided to us for nothing. So that's the, the foundation of the internet. But on top of that foundation, further structures are built. And I want to talk to you about two of those today. First of all, Wikipedia. You know, perhaps the iconic example of the digital gift economy, and the fifth most visited site on the internet today. Wikipedia is based on a complex of three distinct gift economy practices. First of all, Wikipedia's product, its encyclopedic pages of information, like so many other web pages, is delivered to us for free as a gift. Secondly, Wikipedia does have to interface with the market economy. It's, it has to buy things like servers and bandwidth for its network, but it funds that by asking for donations. Mostly those donations are provided by ordinary users of Wikipedia, but on an entirely voluntary basis and only a tiny proportion of Wikipedia's users contribute. So that's the second gift economy practice. Thirdly, Wikipedia's product, those pages that we download, is produced by hundreds of thousands of volunteer editors. Editors who donate their labor as a gift to Wikipedia. Now, traditional economists 
find that a bit difficult. They think labor is a sacrifice and therefore people would only do it if they were paid. But Wikipedia's editors do it for other reasons. Some of them find the work intellectually rewarding. Some of them enjoy doing something that helps other people. Some of them like to feel part of a community of editors pursuing a common goal. Some of them um, feel that they can earn a reputation within that community and value that. All of them choose their own tasks. And when disagreements develop between editors, they're resolved by communally agreed processes. I'm not suggesting that Wikipedia is perfect, but despite that, it is a fascinating and an enormously successful case of the digital gift economy in action. The second case that I want to talk about is rather different. Um, it's not so much an obvious case of the di digital gift economy as a kind of hybrid form. And the case I'm thinking about is Google and its search service. Google, as you're probably aware, is one of the most heavily used. Um, something like a quarter of the world's population use Google search on a daily basis. Possibly the most widely used service from a single supplier that there has ever been. And it's also an extremely lucrative service for Google. Google last year uh, made s over $67 billion of revenue from advertising on websites. Search wasn't the whole of that, but it was the biggest single piece. S and on the basis of that, of course, Google is also now the second most highly valued company in the world. So that doesn't sound much like a, a gift economy story so far, does it? But it's only one half of the Google story. None of that advertising revenue, none of that stock market value would be possible if it wasn't for the other half of Google's business model, which is it gives us things for nothing. It gives us email, gives us maps, it gives us many, many things, but I want to focus on the search service. Search is a kind of gift that Google gives to us. What kind of gift is it? It's, it's what I call an inducement gift. An inducement gift is a gift that is designed or intended to generate a subsequent transaction that produces a commercial benefit for the original giver. Now you might say, hold on, that doesn't sound like a gift to me. People don't get benefits from giving gifts, do they? But that would be to misunderstand the way that gifts work. Gifts very often involve a return. The classic case of traditional gift economies was one in which people gave gifts. And very often those gifts were later reciprocated. We've already talked about Wikipedia editors. They give their data as a gift, but they get a return, which is the pleasure that they get from taking part in that process. For Google, the return that they get from this gift of free search is they get something that has always been the holy grail of advertising. They get information about what we are interested in right now. They know that if they give us ads that are about the thing we just searched for, we're far more likely to click on them. Now at this point, Google aren't making any money from us, but at the moment when we click on that link, that's when the money starts to flow. So Google is an enormously profitable business, but it's an enormously profitable business that is built on the giving of gifts. Now, Wikipedia and Google are important not only in their own rights, of course, but also because they're the tip of an iceberg of gift and hybrid, non-market and semi-market form of economy that have proliferated on the internet. And that's important because it shows us 
that these non-market forms of economy are not just archaic survivals from the past. This is still a growing and dynamic sector of our economy today. Now, I want to conclude by uh, drawing three lessons from that, as Susan Cain did too. And the first thing is that we need a new kind of economics. We need an economics that can make sense of non-market forms of economy as well as market forms. An, eco an economics that values things that are not sold as well as things that are. Secondly, we need a new kind of economy where non-market forms can proliferate and grow. That doesn't mean disposing of the market economy entirely, but it does mean that we need to recognize, to value and to encourage non-market forms alongside it. And thirdly, and this is where you come in, we need a new kind of politics of the economy. You know, the, the, the right's obsession with markets is not viable. The left's obsession with the state is not viable, and nor is there some sort of viable middle path between the two. We need a different path altogether. A politics of economic diversity that's oriented to cooperation and human need. And we need people like you to insist that our politicians make space for that. Thank you.